Well, good morning, online family. We are just so excited that you are uh, joining us this morning. Um, hope you're well out there. At this time, we're just about to ready to get into worship, but let's go ahead and fix our hearts, fix our minds on Jesus right now. If it's okay, I'd like to pray us in um, for God to just meet us where we're at. So right now, God, we just, we just ask for a downpour of your presence this morning, God. No matter what we're going through, good or bad, God, we just want you. We want to spend time with you. So we just say, come and have your way in our hearts, have your way in our homes, have your way in our lives, God. And we say thank you. We can't say thank you enough. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen.
come out of that grave, come out of that grave when we sing. Captive, let go of those chains, let go of those chains when we praise. Dead man, come out of that grave, come out of that grave when we sing. Captive, let go of those chains, let go of those chains when we praise. Dead man, come out of that grave.
change to come Knowing the battles won For you have never failed me yet You promise You promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You never fail me Cause I know Jesus, you still know.
wasted, no failure or mistake. You're an artist and a potter on the canvas and the clay. Good morning, Fountain Gate Online Campus. Um, it's crazy that just uh, in a matter of seven and a half months, something has been created here at Fountain Gate that I thought might come in the future sometime, but, but God. And now we have a very viable campus of online believers, those that many of you that are part of Fountain Gate that were regular attendees here, uh, but just for obvious reasons are, are taking your time and coming back. And then many of you who've never been to our building. Uh, man, what a joy it is to know that we're being able to reach uh, many, many people that we would maybe never have been able to reach otherwise. And so we see this online campus develop. You know, I, I think a great way, we talk about inviting visitors to church and uh, you know, it's always a little nerve-wracking uh, to, to go over next door to your neighbor or standing in line with somebody at HEB. You kind of do a shoulder tap and ask them if they're going to a church home anywhere. You know, you're always a little, it's always a little uh, nerve-wracking to kind of go there. But it's an interesting thing. With an online campus, you have a way of inviting people to church that's pretty, pretty simple. Uh, as you're watching this with me today, it's very simple. You just look uh, at, at uh, your screen there to where you can share this message, share this service with someone else. Because here's the truth. Uh, what we've done our best at Fountgate to do is to get this out on as many platforms as we could to reach as many friends as possible. But the truth is you have friends that we don't have. And so I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Share this, man. It's really just that simple. Share this with those that are your friends on Facebook and uh, let folks know what's going on here, because the bottom line is, this message, I, I believe, what I'm about to share with you in the series we're in, uh, is, is, is vital and important enough that it's not just something that you need to receive, but something that you need to give away, and this is your chance to do that. So, welcome. We're glad you're here. Would you just join me in prayer as we prepare to just jump in to part two of our series, Jesus Is. Pray with me. Father, thank you for every precious life that's viewing this online. Today, we pray that your anointing be on this word, that your grace be upon it, and that there be a spirit of revelation on this message. I believe this to be an extremely important doctrinal truth to the foundation of who we are as a kingdom people. So I pray your blessing on it, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is part two on our series, uh, Jesus Is. I shared last week, um, we have kind of, uh, through all that's happened the last few months, have made some shifts in terms of even our preaching calendar. We had things that we had planned to preach, and the Lord just brought me back to the fact that we've got to get back to the basics. We've got to preach the good news, which is the gospel. That's what gospel means. And at the core, obviously, of the gospel is Jesus, who Jesus is. Last week, we talked about how that Jesus is grace. I encourage you to listen to that message. Uh, go uh, uh, to our website and pull that up, watch that message. Today, part two is this. We're about Jesus is God in flesh. Jesus is God in flesh. I want to talk to you about the person of of Jesus Christ. Here's the truth. Jesus is 100% God, and he's 100% man for all eternity. When Jesus came to earth, he wasn't 50% man, 50% God. He was 100% God, holy God, W-H-O-L-L-Y, and certainly H-O-L-Y. He was holy God, but he was also holy man, 100% God, 100% man. The dual nature of Christ is a core doctrine 
in the church. And it's extremely important that we're solid on that. There, that there's no wiggle room there at all. All other religions, from cults, different religions, occultic groups, wolves that are just out in the flock to bring deception, they get this doctrine wrong. See, God became human, a human in Jesus Christ. Now, don't sit back and try to logically run that through your logical filter. That's the point where we have to tap into faith, recognizing that your logic isn't going to be able to pick this up, but the Spirit of God in you will bring revelation to this truth to your heart today. So he became human in Jesus Christ. This is known as the incarnation. Uh, Incarnation comes from a Latin word meaning in flesh. Although it's not a biblical word, it presents still a biblical truth. Jesus is the eternal God who became flesh and blood. Jesus became a man at a point in time in history. He did so without giving up his oneness with God. Uh, He became a human being without a sin nature. Uh, In flesh means more than just Jesus came in a physical body. We need to understand that he was a complete human personality. He took on a new nature. By the incarnation, we don't mean that God was turned into a human or that Jesus ceased to be God while he was a man. The incarnation means this, that while remaining God, Jesus took up a new nature, which was a human nature. So the incarnation was the uniting of of the divine and the human into one being. One person, Jesus Christ, was fully God, fully human. Holy God and holy human. He laid aside, we know from Scripture, his heavenly glory to do this and becoming a human being. His, his heavenly glory had to be laid aside so that he could come and then live among us. Here's the great question that begs an answer. Why in the world would he do this? Why would he leave where he, uh, where he was at the right hand of the Father, where he was uh, in, in a place of absolute perfection. Why would he leave all that to come here? Scriptures give us several reasons why, and that's what we're going to jump into. Uh, if you're taking notes, you can uh, take these down, write these notes down. Certainly, we've talked each week about getting our app. You can follow the notes on our app. They're all there. But number one is this. Why did he do this? Number one is this. He wanted to further reveal God to humanity. Say it again. He wanted to further reveal God to humanity. The first and foremost reason was to give a revelation, or even a further revelation, of who God was to humanity. What better way to do it except that God came and took on flesh? If you wish to know what God is like, you need to go no further than to look at Jesus. You want to know what God's like? Look at Jesus. He's compassionate. He's loving. He's kind. He's holy, he's just, he's pure, he's lovely, on and on. The Bible says this in John 1, 18, no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who is at the Father's side, has made him known. So we know that we see God through the person of Jesus. Jesus, uh, the, the, the verse, let me share this verse, the verse teaches here in John 1, 18 that Jesus was basically explaining God to humanity. We need no longer worry, again, about what God or wonder what God is like. Jesus shows us. Jesus himself said that. He answered by saying, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone, this is John 14, verse 9, anyone who has seen me has seen who? Has seen the Father. How can, how can you say, show us the Father? Look, you're looking at him. That's what Jesus was saying to Philip. John 14, verse 9. So he came, number one, because he wanted to further reveal God to humanity. Number two, Jesus came to fulfill God's promises, certainly to certain people that prophesied his coming. A number of promises to people like Adam, Noah, Abraham, David. Think about Adam. To Adam, he was the promised Messiah, the seed 
of the woman. We see this in Genesis 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. What a powerful, prophetic word that is given here by, uh, by Moses concerning Jesus. Um, so incredible when you think, especially in terms of uh, the fact that uh, there was a concerted effort, there was an initiation, uh, an initiative put out by Herod to, 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 because he had heard rumor of a Messiah being born, to, to kill all children to and under, uh, to make sure that this seed be snuffed out, that this seed not fulfill its purpose. Because the enemy knows that this seed, while, may, while he may be bruised on the hill, the seed will ultimately crush his head. You think about Moses, what happened with Moses. There was that generation. They tried to wipe out all those babies to try to keep Moses from being that deliverer. That was the seed that God preserved and that God protected because the enemy knew that seed would eventually crush his head. When you think about Jesus, certainly he knew that that seed would crush his head. I'll tell you what I'm, what I'm thinking about right now is when you think about 1973, an effort to abort uh, children and make that legal uh, 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 in our nation. It's now some 60 million plus babies have been aborted since 19. So you know what that is? It's 1973. That was an attempt of the enemy, just like with Moses, just like with Jesus, to snuff out the seed that was meant, that would come, that would ultimately crush the head of Satan. And I'm telling you, that seed will again survive just like it did through Moses, just like it did through Jesus, just like it will through even the effort to wipe out a generation. And I believe that seed is in you and I. What a prophetic, powerful word that is. Then think about Abraham. To Abraham, Jesus was his one descendant who would bless the world. It's in Genesis 12, verse 3. So I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. And we know that Jesus was, uh, that Abraham was in the lineage of Jesus, that Jesus would bring forth that ultimate blessing of salvation to mankind. For David, think about David. To David, Jesus was the promised king that would come from his family. 2 Samuel 7, verse 12 says this, When your days are complete, you lie down with your fathers. I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. What descendant? It was being referred to prophetically by Samuel to David. He was talking about Jesus. He was prophetically speaking of Jesus who would come to establish the kingdom of God. See, the coming of Jesus fulfilled this promise. We know what the angel said to Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 31. You will be with child and give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. So why did he come? To reveal, further reveal God to humanity. Second, to fulfill God's promise to certain people, uh, to these uh, the patriarchs and matriarchs of the word. And then number three, Jesus came to die for the sins of the world. You see, when sin entered the world, God immediately instituted the concept of substitutionary sacrifice. Let me explain that. Substitutionary sacrifice was this, where God would require the sacrifice to die. But here's what happened. There, there were in the old covenant all kinds of sacrifices, animal sacrifices that would, were made uh, prior to the new covenant and Jesus coming. But the sacrifice of animals could not, at the end of the day, take away sin. Neither would the death of any ordinary human uh, being be a satisfactory way of removing sin. What was needed, and I know you know this, was a perfect, unblemished lamb, a perfect sacrifice. And we know that this was accomplished with God when he became a human being. Hebrews 9, 13 to 14 says, for if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer 
sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more? Those three very powerful words. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Christ's coming was to die on the cross for the sins of the world. When Christ came, he sacrificed himself on Calvary's cross. Jesus himself testified of that right there in Hebrews chapter 9. It was the blood of the perfect lamb, Jesus, that would take away the sins of the world. Number four, why did he come? Why would God come through the incarnation, take on flesh through Jesus? Number four, it's this. Jesus came to bring in a new covenant a new covenant, a new promise. Jesus not only fulfilled the promises of the old covenant, his coming brought a new covenant into existence. Here's the passage. Matthew chapter 6, uh, actually chapter 26, verse 26 says this. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, you know the passage, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them saying, drink from it all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then we see this in Matthew 20, verse 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give, listen to this, and to give his life as a ransom for many. I want you to stop just a moment with me right where you're at and just let that sink in a little bit. (laughs) The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, even in our sin, even in the, even in the, uh, the uncertainty of us ever coming to him, he came and died for us anyway. Talk about a love. Talk about a love for his people. He loves us. He desires that no man perish. He came and gave his life as a ransom for many. Number five is this. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. So powerful. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for that. I know you look around and you, you think, well, the devil looks pretty powerful to me, but I'm going to tell you something, he's not. Uh, he's not. Jesus came for the purpose of destroying the works of the devil. And the truth is, now as believers, we are here to enforce the victory that Christ has already won. We've been given authority to enforce this victory that he's already won. While Satan's still left to kind of roam about, his day's coming, his hour's coming. And I want you to hear this. You've been given the authority. You're part of absolutely coming into a place of authority against him and doing the same. As Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy, you've been given an anointing and authority to do the same. Jesus, his coming was certainly to destroy the enemy's stronghold over humanity. Here's the passage, 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose was the Son of God manifest, that he would destroy or that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus' death on the cross frees us from the power of sin. Hear this, the devil no longer has any right to control us because Christ now has given us the freedom to choose not to sin. He's lost his grip on us. The only power, I've said this so many times before, but the only power he has is the power that we give him. We've been given all we need through Christ, his son, through the infilling of the Holy Spirit in our lives, through the authority that that brings, the anointing that that brings. We've been given all that we need to overcome the works of the enemy. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you're facing. You may have a child that's in rebellion. You may be facing a physical battle that is, is daunting. Uh, your marriage may be on the rocks. It may be that you've just lost your job. There's a lot of uncertainty into the world right now. Certainly there is. But at the end of the day, I'm telling you, you have to stop and get back to the bedrock of who you are in faith, that you've been given the power, the authority, the anointing to overcome the enemy. Romans 8 says, in fact, you're an overwhelming conqueror in Christ. Don't be deceived by what you see. (laughs) Don't let what you see cause you to move away from who you are. Does that make sense? 
Hear that. Man, his death on the cross freed us from sin. The Bible says this, God was in Christ. This is in, uh, uh, in Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.19, it says, For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. He made him sin for us that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. Uh, There's such a power-packed scripture that he made him, Christ, sin for us that we may be made the righteousness of God. He took on the sin of humanity so that we, too, might share in the same ministry that he had. What did he come to do? To destroy the works of the enemy. Why? So that he might reconcile, to free mankind or free humankind from the grip and the power of Satan so that their eyes and their ears, spiritual eyes and ears, could be open to the truth of who they are as sons and daughters of God to then be reconciled or brought into right relationship or brought into oneness with their heavenly Father. Christ came to do that. And in fact, it says here that we've been given the same ministry of reconciliation. Incredible. That's who we are. He came into the world to become humanity's Savior. Without His coming and becoming humanity, a human, we, we, we wouldn't have a Savior. It just wouldn't have happened. Let, let me talk to you for just a minute about the two natures of Christ in a little more detail, just as we dig into this a little further, mind down a little further. I'm, I'm not much longer, but just follow this. You see, Jesus came in human flesh. Again, he's not half God. He's not half man. He's fully God, fully man. So at the incarnation, he added to his divine nature the nature of man. I just want to develop this with you a little more because it's so powerful. Thus, he has two natures, divine and human. He is both God and man at the same time. He's not merely a man who had God within him, nor is he a man who manifested the God principle. He is God, second person of the Trinity. That's who he is. He's part of the Trinity. He is God. Hebrews 1.3 says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Jesus' two natures are not mixed together, nor are they combined into a new God-man nature. Okay? They, they, they are separate, yet act as a unit. And this is a big word, it, it, and uh, you may have never heard it before, but this is called the hypostatic union. Separate and yet still one unit. It's not a mixing together of God and man. He was still fully God, fully man, separate, but in one unit. That's the hypostatic union. It's a mystery. We have to accept these things by faith, like I said earlier. But, but we need to understand its significance or we can end up honestly believing a false gospel. I think if there's any one thing that can trip people up in terms of beginning to move away from the Word of God and the foundational doctrines of God's Word, it's this one concept. It's this one thought because that's where... Again, you see the delineation with cults and occults and those that are in deception. First Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Let's talk about this idea of him being a man. I, I want to delve into this just a little further, that Jesus became a man. John 1.14, here we go. It says, And the Word became flesh dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Then this very powerful passage in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, listen to this closely. Even better, I hope you follow along here. I'm throwing these scriptures out pretty quick. This is Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, verse 7, by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So as man, this is what he did. He worshiped the Father. We see it in John 17, verse 2. He worshiped the Father. 
since you've been given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have been given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. He's praying, conversing with his heavenly Father. I glorified, he says this in verse 4, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I have hold, had with you before the world existed. So we worship the Father in John 17. He prayed to the Father, John 17, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Jesus was a prayer warrior. Jesus spent time with the Father in that sense. I hope you hear this correctly. He didn't have, as, as, as a man, he didn't have kind of certain special privileges that you and I don't share or have. Jesus had to approach the Father just like you and I have to approach the Father. Powerful. He was called a man. We see this in Mark chapter 15, 39. He says, and when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in, 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 uh, in this way he breathed his laugh and said, truly, this man was the Son of God. And then John 19, 5 says, so Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, behold the man, Jesus. We know that he was called the Son of Man. John 9, verse 35, Jesus heard they cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, And in, in who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. Talking about Jesus as a man. You know what else? He was tempted as a man. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The difference between maybe Jesus and us is uh, not maybe, definitely, though he was tempted, he didn't fall prey to sin, to the temptation. Can I tell you, we're all going to be tempted, all of us. Then we have a choice like Jesus had to make to say no to the temptation and not follow through in sin. He was tempted just like you and I are tempted. He grew in wisdom, it says in Luke 2, verse 52. Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Just making the point that he was a man. He died, Romans 5, 8 says, but God shows his love for us that while we were at sinners, Christ died for us. This, he had a body of flesh and bones, Luke 24, 39. See my hands, see my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me, he said, and see. Talking to Thomas, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. I think one of the more common errors that non-Christian cults make is not understanding this aspect of the two natures of Christ. For an example, those that are Jehovah's Witnesses focus on Jesus' humanity, and they ignore his divinity. They believe that Jesus is the angel Michael, not the Son of God. On the other hand, the Christian scientists believe they focus more on the divine nature, and they ignore the human side of who he is. You see, there's that difference, but they can't grab hold of this hypostatic union, 100% man, 100% God, not mingled together, yet separate, but acting as one unit. For a proper understanding of Jesus, and therefore all other doctrines that relate to him, his two natures must be properly understood. They have to be properly divine. That's why we're taking the time, I'm taking the time with you this morning to make sure you know and understand how important this doctrine is, how foundational it is. We're getting back to the foundational truths of what the Word of God says concerning us. And if we are on a rocky foundation, everything else becomes rocky along with that. The Bible's all about Jesus. We see this in John 5, verse 39. It says, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Right now, here's the cool thing. <laughs> there is a man in heaven on the throne of God. Holy man, holy God, Jesus. It says in 1 John 2, 1, he's our advocate with the Father. My little children, he says, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate in the man Jesus. In the Lord Jesus with the Father, who is Jesus Christ, the righteous. 
we have a Savior in Christ, Titus 2.13, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have a Lord. He is our Lord. He is Jesus, Romans 10, verse 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and and is saved. Man, I, I, I know that uh, this is one of those topics that, uh, boy, you have to just really settle into and make sure that you're looking at these truths through the lens of faith. Um, because that's where you begin to get the revelation of what all this means and why Jesus, why he had to come and take on a human form. It was so that we might then have that per- perfect sacrifice, his blood shed as, as an atonement for our sins, that we might be at one, atonement's a great word, at one moment, so that we might be at one with the Father. We've been reconciled to God the Father through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus, the perfect man who was perfectly God. I want to just challenge you as we close this service. I know there may be some of you listening to this message that have never given your hearts and lives to Christ. You've never accepted him into your life as your Lord and Savior. Romans 10, 9 and 10 makes it real clear. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You'll be saved. And I want to give you that opportunity today. If you would, just bow your heads with me as you're watching this this morning and I want you all just to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming and taking on flesh, for becoming a man so that you could come and give your life as a ransom for many, as a sacrifice for my salvation. And today I ask you to come into my heart. I confess with my mouth, Jesus, that you are Lord. And I believe in my heart, God, that you raised him from the dead. So come and save me. Come into my heart. I give you my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and wash me clean by the blood of Jesus. Thank you for saving me, Jesus. I want to serve you now all the days of my life. In your name I pray. Amen. Man, if you prayed that really simple prayer today, uh, we have moderators that are that are watching the services on both our platforms. Uh, on the online platform, you can even check a box there and raise your hand to say that you made a decision to accept Christ. We'd love to get some information from you. It's really important. We've got a, a, a great packet of things that we can give to you for your next step. Uh, I know Pastor Vince will, will go out of his way as he uh, gets that information to get that to you. And so please let us know. Again, I want to thank you for allowing me into your living rooms or homes, wherever you're at today. I want to just wish you a great week. Bless you. Speak that blessing over you. God, go before you in all that you do this week and give you favor in all that you do. Did he keep you healthy and strong? Did he protect you in all things? Bless you. Have a great day. Hey, church family. I hope you'll find ways to apply Pastor Scott's points to your life this week as we're all growing in our faith. It's not too late to click the connect card if you're in the church online platform because we'd like to get to know you better and get you connected to our online community. If you're watching one of our Facebook rebroadcasts at 3, 6, 9, or 11 p.m., please private message us with your prayer needs or any salvation questions that you might have. Well, we're all wrapped up with our church online this week, so have a great one, and we're going to see you on Wednesday night for live Facebook connect group. And then again, next Sunday at 11 a.m. God bless.